Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week we are speaking with Paul Weston. Paul is an author and lecturer based in Glastonbury, and one that I've had the pleasure of speaking with in the flesh multiple times. Today he joins us to talk about synchromistic creative journeys and the works of Kenneth Grant. Paul Weston, lovely to hear your voice. Come in, Glastonbury. Yeah, Golden. This is brilliant. We were just talking before we hit the record button. Uh, Paul was one of the people I would um, see on my regular jaunts to Glastonbury, which I miss terribly. And it's uh, it's still one of those funny things about the modern world that we can uh, have these clear conversations from one side of it to the other. So uh, very glad to have you on board. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Gordon. Nice one. So uh, we've been emailing backwards and forwards about things, uh, synchromistic things, and I guess synchromysticism. Uh, as a as a noun, and it seems to have grown, um, and we, this is largely in discussion of a mutual friend of ours, Chris Knowles, seems to have grown from what you might uncharitably call a method of textual analysis to, I would argue, uh, an essential map uh, for the modern world. So, I mean, how do you feel about that, Paul? I think is that uh, what is synchromysticism? Do you think it's now? Um, necessary to stay sane? Uh, how, how do you think about these things? Well, I'm coming from a long-rooted Robert Anton Wilson uh, kind of background, whereby the whole mentality that he tries to cultivate with Cosmic Trigger is just part of my mental furniture. So I have a kind of sense that consciousness and where we all get to with our understanding of various deep subjects does impact the way reality configures around us and that we're reaching some kind of uh, critical mass that's not perhaps a million miles away from what dear old Terence McKenna used to call the Omega point. Well, it's, it's configuring in a way that we might not have thought would be in quite that way when we were talking about 2012, but we're getting a complete kitchen sink of everything being thrown in and being thrown in a way that it's alive. And it's just throwing up this kind of sense that there is a deep, mythic, inscrutable drama revealing itself and that our own consciousness is crucial in how it reveals itself. Uh, and I think it goes really badly for us and that the stakes are quite high so we'd better be in our absolute highest magical and intellectual integrity in order to navigate it and stay sane and not be destroyed by it. I think that's uh, that's a really correct statement. Uh, it's funny you mentioned 2012 because it brought back a memory of, of being back in London and I was listening to you on some show or another, and this was years ago. It, was, it might have even been 2013 because I think you and I are of uh, the same opinion that. Um, 2012 actually happened. <laughs> uh, it just didn't look Not like what people we were thought. Before, that's for certain. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, if what do you think? Is it, here's a weird question, if we talk about it from a 2012 perspective, is it cyclical? Is there a cyclical component to it? There is, there's a lot of stuff that uh, seems to have a, a calendar match. So is is that... Part of it, or is that something we're bringing to these phenomena? I, I think that we are sort of poised between, you know, one epoch and another. And if we look to the Hindu model, uh, the likes of the Kali Yuga and so on, uh, we've certainly got, you know, we've certainly had in the last century some extraordinary indications that we are in a debased and degenerate age and that everything is, is, is definitely going in some kind of spiral down, down the cosmic plug hole. And, and the old forms clearly have run out of steam because the way that they're staggering about, you know, in a very bizarre psychotic coma at the moment, as witnessed on the world political stage, you know, shows that something else is trying to break through. Uh, and I think there are people that undoubtedly on the world stage are, are kind of aware of that. You know, they're in the background, maybe, they, that they have their sense of how to play the game, uh, how to bring the chaos factor in. And it is, you know, I don't want to get too much into this, but we're almost exactly a year on from um, President Trump. And I think 
people are still behaving as if the old world and the old way of thinking is what will somehow get us through this. And yet the mere fact that President Trump ever even happened in the first place indicated that people just didn't really understand what the hell was going on anymore. And that ought to be an, enough proof for them. <laughs> but agreed, it, it agreed. Isn't. They're still stuck in the same different paradigms of, of how, how they're framing their dialogue and the conflicts between people and their ideological. You know, it's all, it's very, very strange. The trickster is rampant. It is. And I think one of the hallmarks of, of being in that new world is, as you say, that um, the old models don't work. And, and a lot of the kind of um, psychic and psychological tension is people, um, you know, thinking they're riding a horse when they're driving a car. Well, you've only got to look at the way um, people are still, you know, Democrats, Republicans, people crapping on about Hillary Clinton, blah, blah, blah. It's just another level of the game now and a whole bunch of stuff has got to be let go of if we're going to figure out how we are going to survive and stay sane in this agreed well let's um let's talk about some of uh some of those things and also how uh uh, and also how this map is potentially uh, a a higher resolution one for the terrain so let's have a have a talk about some uh some signs and portents and uh, where something like um say uh, the recent ish uh, manchester manchester incident kind of lines up with the work you've been doing this year yeah well i'm engaged in writing a book called atagaris now atagaris people that don't know is a Phoenician goddess often depicted in the form of a mermaid, you know, and uh, readers of the Secret Sun would immediately start twitching uh, when they hear that motif. Now, the thing is, the story that I'm telling here is about events that happened to me 25 years ago, uh, a period between August 1992 and February 1993. Very uh, extraordinarily condensed time of all kinds of things going on. One of the darkest, weirdest, most magically intense periods of the whole of my life. And I I, I got the idea that it was time to start writing this pretty much a year ago, last November. Now, the cover art of my books has always been extremely important to me, extremely important. And I'm very, very lucky that I've got a great artist, Yuri Leach, who's uh, been a friend of mine for decades and lives in Glastonbury, and I can commission him. And if I say, can you do such and such, I know he will. And it's always important to me to kind of get a sense of what the cover is going to be right when I start constructing these things. So at the end of last year, he'd worked for me before and he'd done my own version, if you like, of various Crowley tarot images. The cover of Avalonian Eon is is a Glastonbury version of the Crowley Eon card. The cover of my Glastonbury Zodiac and Earth Mysteries Ufology is a Glastonbury version of Crowley's Sun card with imagery of, of the signs of the so-called Glastonbury Zodiac. So I started thinking broadly what I was going to go for was a version of the Crowley Queen of Cups, because that's a, a figure that Atagartis could configure with. And I already had a sense at the end of last year, I was seeing um, a Syrian depiction of Atagartis, a kind of base relief that was in the mermaid form. I'd seen another Roman version that actually looks a bit like Alistair Crowley that had a serpent wound round it. I thought, well, okay, we'll mix the two together. We're going to have it against the background of the mysterious Margate Seashell Grotto. That all features in the story. And I got a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation. This is our our, our much detail I put into the work that I sent to Yuri. I, I, I get it pretty much down to the millimetre. I sent him a whole PowerPoint presentation. This is what I want. And the face was just going to be something inspired by some generic image of a mermaid I'd found on the internet. I sent that to him last December. But he's a busy man. He's a busy man and he couldn't quite, you know, kept getting postponed because other work came along. And the way this got postponed, uh, allowed you know i'm I'm so 
infused by the mix of magic and art and creativity and synchronicity and and something just stepped into this process because if he'd been able to do this back in january um it would all have been finished and and what then played out in may would not have been able to happen now there was a, a production a london run of the cosmic trigger play that daisy campbell got together and it was it ran for a little while and broadly kept the same cast but there are a few people that kind of stepped here in to play the same role and one of the things that they got going on there is right at the beginning of the play uh they have somebody come on as as the goddess ishtar this is actually in the original cosmic trigger at the very beginning and she basically does uh a striptease with these ritual items of clothing that she's got on and stands naked in front of the crowd for just a moment at the very start of the play and i saw on facebook that someone i know in glastonbury called aria uh had secured a gig one night doing this Ishtar number down in London and this has really blown her mind because she was a big Robert Anton Wilson fan so I sent a message of congratulations and we ended up having a chat in the Excalibur where I last met you face to face last year and in the course of the conversation she'd just been out to India and she mentioned in passing that she was hoping to find someone that could uh, do a Reiki master attunement on her. And I said, well, yeah, hey, I can do that. And so a very interesting little plot was hatched that what we, the way we, we play it was on the, the very day that she was going to go down to London uh, and then, you know, do a, a spectacular number in, in the play that morning she'd meet up with me uh come around to see me at my home and i'd give her a reiki master tumor well this was the 23rd of may uh and we kind of did this and she was very interested in marjorie cameron uh and been saying that there was something about her and she felt that marjorie cameron was present with her in some way and i said well how do you fancy just having a quick look at some of kenneth anger's inauguration of the pleasure dome you know so this was an unconventional reiki situation yeah. <laughs> so what, what that meant was i in order to put my my blu-ray on i put my tv on first and what that meant was what came up on the screen was the big news story of the day because the night before the 22nd had been the manchester bombing now i just kind of absorbed in about 30 seconds an awful lot of impressions instantly because my mind is just you know primed with a gigantic amount of associations and i later you know later on in the day uh, when i started looking on the internet as to what people were saying etc it did start to make me realize that it, there were some pretty damn strange things going on first of all obviously um i was with this lady aria and her name is very similar to ariana Ariana Grande is supposedly, uh, you know, into the Kabbalah. We'll take that with a pinch of salt, but it's out there. She wears the armbands and all the rest of it. This whole thing had happened on the 22nd, you know, Hebrew alphabet, 22 letters, big deal in the Kabbalah. People had already accused her of, of being in the Illuminati in the way that they do with pretty much anybody these days, but it was a case that it had happened. So there was a kind of funny little Robert Anton Wilson tie in. 23 is the big number uh, for Robert Anton Wilson Cosmic Trigger. We were already on the 23rd. Uh, Ariana Grande was 23 years old. She was on the Dangerous Woman Tour, which seems, you know, pretty full on as well. And of course, you know, our association with um, Babylon and Cameron and all the rest of it is that Jack Parsons is kind of killed in an explosion. So. I kind of pondered it for a while uh, and I thought, well, I don't want to, I don't want to become a YouTube comment thread kind of guy. And I don't want to go off into, into real wacko territory, but this, this kind of seems like a pretty strange combination. You know, Aria had actually got a star of Babylon tattooed on one of her legs. You know, she's was really felt that Cameron was about, she doesn't really think in, in these kind of terms and pay attention to what's going on in the world in the way I do, but off she goes. 
to London and I'm completely and utterly spaced out of my head. And at the same period of time, you know, one of the things I'm writing about is the original watching of Twin Peaks that I did back in, in the early 90s. There's quite a lot of that going to be in my new book. And I was, of course, very interested uh, in the return. And somebody uh, that had just started at that point, somebody had, had basically offered to procure for me. Uh, they would manage to get the, the new episodes on the DVD for me. And through my, through my uh, letterbox comes the first four episodes of Twin Peaks to Return, which I literally just watch, you know, one hour later. So I just have an absolutely epic flipping day. And then there's a wonderful photo comes up on Facebook of Aria dressed as Ishtar holding my copy of Cosmic Trigger, which I lent to her. So I thought, this is absolutely amazing. Uh, OK, uh, because it, as well as Atagartis, there's a whole bunch of all these goddesses from that dark, like that period of time. Astarte, Ishtar, Inanna, Ashira, they're all going to be in my my narrative but very much ishtar so i said to you and i said to Aria, how about we put her face as the face of atagartis and she was really happy about this so yuri says okay we'll do this when i get around to painting it so that's that's my there's a whole big configuration of stuff there and we get into july and Yuri starts work on the painting and we're working our way towards Cosmic Trigger Day, July the 23rd, which is always a day that I find is pretty vibey in my life. And I'm out with Aria again and, and we were we were going to do a follow through from this Reiki thing. And she's Italian and her, actual, her middle names are actually Maria Magdalena. And July the 22nd, famous Magdalene feast. I said, OK, how about we do something there? She said, fine. And a couple of days before that, Yuri got the painting to me and I nearly passed out in the street when he, I met up with him and handed it to me because I felt it was the best thing that he'd ever done for me. And I needed to get a good scan of it. So the guy that does my books, I gave that to him. And the idea was, let's preview it on Cosmic Trigger Day. So on the Magdalene Feast, uh, I go with Aria into uh, the Magdalene Chapel um, in the Magdalene Armhouses um, over the road from the Abbey in Glastonbury. And I've printed out a bit of Thunder Perfect Mind from my Crowley book, and she recites that in there. And then we come back to my place here, and I've just received an email with a, a brilliant scan of the painting, which she's really, really happy about. And so the next day, July the 23rd, I premiere that painting all over Facebook and I'll, you know, stick it around social media everywhere. And it just seemed a really, really powerful configuration all the way through. And it, it was also the first of what we were having as a double new moon in Leo uh, this year. Yeah, uh, um, we've had a lot. I won't go into it because uh, plenty of people will already know the stuff that Chris has been going into about Regulus and, and, and so on. It did kind of amplify for me that there was a, a big season uh, was afoot. Uh, and that continued because there's all this talk about Sirius rising on July the 23rd that's come from Cosmic Trigger. And I know that that's not the case anymore. I know that if you're in Egypt and, you know, you're, you're waiting for the sign of Sirius that would, in, in days gone past, uh, its heliac rising would have, would have heralded the inundation of the Nile. It actually happens in the early August now. And I wondered, when does it happen in Glastonbury? You know, when essentially is Cosmic Trigger Day in Glastonbury? When is does Sirius rise above the horizon for the first time after its long period of absence? So I asked my man, Andy Collins, who now knows his way around the astronomical software a little bit after all his work with Cygnus and never knows what else over the last 10 years or more. You know, can you tell me when it happens? Uh, and he got back to me very quickly. Uh, essentially, it's August the 13th. Uh, if you were actually standing on Glastonbury Tour at sunrise, um, strictly speaking, it's there. You wouldn't actually see it with a naked eye because the, the, the luminosity of the sun would be too much at that stage. But give it another week or so and you would see it. So essentially, it was August the 13th. Uh, and the interesting thing was I ended up um, on the day that I discovered this, hanging out with Seth, a, a, a bit of an OTO social, and they were... 
literally going to have uh, some of their initiations the very next day, which was the 13th. And there were a couple of people there who appreciated that to be going through that uh, essentially at serious rising cosmic trigger, Glastonbury um, latitude 2017 was pretty damn cool. So all of that what is, is is kind of there in the background. In fact, it, it's so full on that I'm actually going to, I'm having to write a little appendix. It's worth putting all that in about how this cover um, came together because it's a measure of, uh, you know, it's an old story that, that I'm aware of. Every time Andy Collins writes a book, it's like the subject matter comes to life. He might be writing about something that, he, that happened years ago but, you know, here I am writing about stuff from 25 years ago. But this stuff, the way all that's kind of thing configured w- was so full of magical vitality and so full of strangeness. And the way that it did sink in with the weirder drama, you know, a- around Manchester, around Area and Grand, uh, and around Twin Peaks The Return, uh, there was no separation there. You know, it was a unity. And it was a unity through my, you know, magical consciousness and my attunement to synchronicity and multiple levels of information. Yeah. So I, this is why I like when you use the term configuration, because for the people, I mean, people who are listening to this are by and large magically operant uh, and very often creative as well. And I, I was just listening to that as usual, wrapped Paul, because uh, what I enjoy about your book so far is that the writing of the book ends up in the book because the writing of the book configures and is implicated in in the story and 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 the landscape and and the and the body of research and this is something so that remarkable, you have. remarkable process you know um and, and as we carry on and I, I i go into the kenneth grant territory it's stuff that dates back in my life to to 1991 and yeah a whole in terms of of, of the attempt to render it in a form that's interesting and magically potent it has come to life and a whole kitchen sink worth of stuff has been thrown in which is not so much new but enhances it to such an extent that it, it, it's just absolutely done my head in you know and it's it took me 10 and a half years to write Avalon and Eon it's certainly taken me longer than I thought to do this one but I think I'm in the home stretch and I'm hoping to get it completed by next february really which is going to be the 25th anniversary of the climax of of the whole story awesome well i'm I'm, i have every confidence you will but tell us some of that stuff as you were saying you know continue with the story of of working with the kenneth grant um i guess thread lines through this material right right so now we did have a few years back, uh, our epic conversation where I pretty much threw the, com- the, the kitchen sink in uh, about it, a whole bunch of, of bizarre and powerful and disturbing and weird and hilarious stories from the days of the yeah. And that, for people listening, went. will be in the show notes that um, Paul and I had a great afternoon at the Georgian Pilgrim in Glastonbury, uh, and you'll find that below if you're listening. Right. Well, I probably told the story. Um, I haven't listened to it for a while of of Graham Phillips and his raising of an Egyptian queen um, in a house in Wolverhampton in in 1981. This is where it starts. I'll tell it briefly um, in case people quite possibly heard it before. But but Graham Phillips, initially um, author of the contentious paranormal classic Green Stone, the story of the recovery by psychic means of a talismanic jewel, supposedly handed down through the ages that originated in ancient Egypt. There are a lot of people that diss the hell out of it and foam at the mouth and get all tutty about all of this stuff. I can only say from my own experience that having connected to the wider current of psychic cresting, the potency of it in my life has been absolutely gigantic. Graham had the, had the stone, and in 1981, he was, he was living in a flat in Wolverhampton. A whole bunch of stuff had happened with it, and he thought that that was the end of it, and that maybe you know that another story would unfold. But it wasn't the end, because he started having dreams uh, repeatedly of ancient Egyptian scenes, um, all seem for a kind of dramatic red mist where this mysterious, uh, sultry um, Isis priestess queen uh, starts basically talking to him and telling him a little bit about her life. 
she calls herself Sarai. There's all these dramatic scenes. You can see uh, the constellation of Ursa Major. You can see various power politics and strange sexual stuff going on. And this woman has come to the throne, but she hasn't lasted long. But she's a priestess of some archaic cult, and she wants basically to be brought back to life. And uh, the Green Stone will in some way help, him, help her do this. So Graham is inspired to draw a huge great Egyptian mural uh, across the living room wall in a manner that he's, he's never really shown any talent for anything like this before. And he sets himself up to do this on, on the night of July the 22nd, 1981. And he's made some special incense that he's, he's picked up the details by psychic means and all the rest of it. He's got this weird ceremony, all these words he's going to say. And he's going to touch this drawing of this uh, Egyptian queen on the wall with the green stone, you know, on her eyes and her nose and her mouth and all this kind of malarkey. And the way it worked out was he had expected to do it on his own, but he got unexpectedly interrupted by a couple of people that have been part of the Greenstone story turning up. And they're kind of a bit nonplussed. What the hell are you doing, Graham? Uh, but it's fortunate that they they can at least back up the story of what is, what is supposed to have happened because it's a pretty goddamn unbelievable one. They do, he does this little thing, they sit and watch, 20 minutes, half an hour goes by, and it's, okay, that's it, well, what happens now? Well, who knows, maybe we'll pick, you know, some strange bit of information will come our way, something will happen in the next week that indicates that this thing is a goer. But at that point, there's some tremendous great crash from what they know is the downstairs cellar. And it's pretty damned frightening. But they know they're going to have to investigate. So they approach uh, the cellar um, trap door, which is kind of in a room outside the living room. And before they've even got to it, it has literally flung open as if pushed from up below. And they just brick it and run out into the street. And they're all very confused and hysterical and they meet some guy walking his dog and they, they look at, at, at the house and, and they've, they've had candles lit and the, the curtains are drawn and then they see the lights of the candles getting brighter and brighter and they think, you know, shit, we've set the house on fire. But then the curtains part and they all see hovering in midair, stark naked, apart from a Euro serpent headband, this obviously Egyptian-looking woman. And at that point, they just get you know they just get into their car and just floor it and i in wolverhampton i don't think they stopped till they got to a friend's house in north wales now this obviously you know i totally understand that anyone that just is no flipping way you know no shit like that ever happens to anybody ever they're just lying their asses off i understand that but um a week or so later Graham met up with Andy Collins and gave him all copies of all the notes, everything that he got, and left Andy to sort of look into it. And Andy soon um, came to the conclusion that there was only one person that historically this figure that was being called Sarai could be. And this was a an Egyptian uh, pharaoh called Sobek Nefru Ray, Sobek um, in relation to uh, the crocodile uh, god. And if there, she was the last queen of the 12th dynasty and only ruled for about four years. No real indication that she was necessarily tremendously controversial. Uh, nothing to really anchor uh, quite a bit of stuff that Graham had had about Ursa Major. And then Andy realised that there was a tremendous amount of of linkage of imagery and themes and mood with with Bram Stoker's uh, novel The Jewel of the Seven Stars, which he'd written in 1903, which was about basically uh, a, a, a magically potent Egyptian queen who uh, has somehow managed to find a way uh, to endure beyond death, and she kind of coaxes the discoverers of her tomb into performing a ceremony that will bring her back to life. Now, this has been filmed um, a few times, uh, only a couple of days ago, the Blu-ray of the Hammer, Blood from the Mummy's Tomb, came out. Uh, more famously, Hollywood did The Awakening with Charlton Heston in 1980, and you could easily say that maybe Graham's seen this and he's absorbed it. There's nothing in the historical stuff about Sobek Nefri Ray that suggests that she's in the worst major, but it turns out 
that there is actually, you know, one uh, very famous occultist who had previously given a considerable amount of attention to that very same figure, and this is Kenneth Grant. And in um, Cults of the Shadow, there is a chapter called The Draconian Cult of Ancient Ken, you know, a classic Kenneth Grant chapter heading, in which he, he talks about his, his ongoing uh, subject matter, which is the idea that there is uh, a cult uh, that is stellar in its in its devotions and in its magical concentration that has got a history that goes right back to the roots of humanity in Africa. It's an idea that he's, he's, he's got from the visionary Gerald Massey in many respects. And that throughout the early days of Egypt, there are there are stages of development that go through uh, the stellar cult, uh, which is very much connected with Set, and then a kind of more lunar cult, and then finally the full solar version. And the conflict between the stellar cult and the solar version is an ongoing thing. And Sobek Nefri Ray was actually the ultimate um, priestess and advocate of the draconian cult. It, it reached its complete peak during her reign, according to Grant. She's tremendously important. And and what we get when we look at this, you know, I know that um, I think a while ago you talked to uh, Peter Lavender. You know, he's got his his Dark Lord book out. Uh, had an awful lot to say about set in the magic of Kenneth Grant. And yes. Rightly so, tremendously important, but let's not underestimate uh, the significance of the goddess in this. You know, Grant is very much an advocate of an ancient matriarchal cult and that things went, you know, completely wrong and distorted with the ultimate triumph of the solar cult. And that set as a as the son of the mother is also um, the fertilizer of the mother. Uh, the whole thing becomes very interchangeable in terms of, of uh, what all these star configurations are taken to be, such as Ursa Major and, and Draco and so forth. But the thing is, OK, here's Kenneth Grant, and he's saying these um, very uh, interesting things about Sobek Nofri Ray. But what's, what's, why is she important to him you know what's the story of how all of this happened in the first place and in order to find that we go to Hikati's Fountain which was you know probably the most notorious actually of all Kenneth Grant's books it was it was long delayed and when it, it came out in 1992 a lot of people felt they'd been waiting for waiting for it for quite a long time Right at the very beginning of Ikati's Fountain, you know, we find out what's the score with Sobek Nofru Ray. And it's a book, you know, for those who don't know it, uh, it's full of the most astonishing stories which seem to indicate wild paranormal events, people dying, people going insane, a whole bunch of stuff that's distinctly Lovecrafty and being talked about as if it had actually really happened. And it's difficult to to really figure out where the hell Kenneth Grant was at and what he really meant by it. But there's an amazing uh, little story right at the very beginning, which um, is the story of a little magical ceremonial with the early members of, of Grant's famous new Isis Lodge. So this, this is occurring in, in the mid-50s. And Grant had... had got hold of a fragment of mummy casing dating from the 26th dynasty, which was a time of, of the famous Staler of Revealing, Ankh of Narconsu and so on, a time when he felt that his draconian cult was a, a little bit resurgent. And there was a, a, a very psychic woman who was able to do psychometry and put her hands on, on particular artifacts and gain impressions about them. And she felt that it would be an interesting idea to try and do some work with this, this mummy casing. So they set up uh, the room where they're going to do this, um, decorate it with items that are full of the Egyptian mood. You know, they've got music from lutes and pipes being played. 
uh, there's, there's 10 people in all, including this this priestess, and they've got a mirror. The whole thing's going to come through a mirror that's placed at a slight angle, and she's going to gaze into this as she holds on to this bit of mummy casing. And what's, what's striking about it is that Kenneth Grant claims that it wasn't just her in her entranced state that saw imagery in this mirror everybody in the room that was looking in that mirror behind her saw exactly the same as what she did and this uh basically consisted first of of a dazzlingly white woman reclining on cheetah pelts on a sort of mobile divan that's being carried by black robe figures along this seemingly endless tunnel and it, it kind of starts out as being a scene that's that's physically plausible, but then he, they start talking about ectoplasmic extrusions of the woman's past karmas coiling in drifts like interstellar dust mushrooming and snowing down, a luminous powder on the tunnel walls where they form curious deposits. You know, it's classic Grant. Covered the walls like a green moss imbued with malignant life which swarmed over any surface that presented itself. And she changes colour as a fungoidal tentacle reached out from the wall and explored her body and she resembled a bladder of transparent flesh inflated alternately with vapours of green scarlet mauve and finally with an indigo tinted fluid and, and it all gets a bit orgasmic and a bit weird and, and Grant is quite clear that basically the period in question uh, wasn't the 26th dynasty it was it was identifiably that of the 13th dynasty which is when he places Queen Sebek Nefru Ra one of the great exponents of the draconian tradition and then it gets all sort of psychedelic in the mirror, and then there's another reclining Egyptian woman experiencing some strange magical sexual rapture. There's a plaque placed over a groin area with an unknown hieroglyph, and the more orgasmic she gets, it becomes brilliantly incandescent. And rainbow colours emanate, and, and they come out through the mirror into the ritual room. And the people in the room talk about eye irritation. And one person actually claims that they've been physically levitated several inches above the floor. And the mirror is full of fire and more black robe figures are there. And there are weird incandescent sigils emanating a greenish radiance. And that the actual seeress herself seems to start getting coated in this, in this weird substance that looked like a stone statue. So it's absolutely and utterly flipping bonkers but what this basically is, is is a seminal event in the fact in the early days of the new isis lodge where they they are very much talking about some cosmic influence previously unknown that is coming through from beyond the normal tree of life and the whole enormous great oeuvre of kenneth grant the the whole exploration of the tunnels are set the adverse side of the tree of life which becomes so much part of the typhonian trilogies all comes out of this period of time and although it's difficult to to say from reading it whether the figure that they see is directly so bitten off through ray they have made contact with her magic and her period of time her priestesses her people and this is, is, is what sets all of this off. And during the same period of time, the mid-50s, Grant writes uh, a short novel called The Stella Load. And this thing, you know, doesn't get published until uh, the 1990s. But it's there and it's kind of almost like um, Dion Fortune meets H.P. Lovecraft. But this Stella Load is uh, a kind of... Uh, a, a glass sphere that is a unique uh, shoe stone and it contains the soul of, of a magically potent Egyptian queen and somehow it selects people that are going to be in a temporary possession of it, enables them to become geniuses in their respective field but always in the service of this greater agenda that she will return in full physical form. And it's stated quite clearly in the novel that she is a reincarnation of Sobek Nofru Ray and there are some startling visions in the novel as well. Uh, very, very interesting. And again, this is all part of an enormous great period of time that is uh, absolutely crucial to the ultimate evolution of Kenneth Grant's work. Now, when I was, I was reading all of this, um, you know, here's, here's a, a 
interesting little glimpse of, of, of how all these things tie together decades later because I'd recently watched Inauguration of the Pleasure Dome. There was something about that scene with them all in this in this room uh, and the mirror and the clothes and, uh, and and the strange psychedelia and and rapture and and sexual ecstasies that are being played out that reminded me of, of the kind of general ambience all the way through of, of Kenneth Anger's inauguration pleasure dome and it struck me that you know that film came out in 1954 and the Carty's Fountain material and the early New Isis is, is somewhere 55, 56, somewhere like that. I wondered what are the chances that that film was, was shown in this country and that Kenneth and Steffi Grant would have actually seen it. So I was very fortunate that I was able to ask uh, Caroline Wise, because Caroline had, had helped publish uh, Kenneth's books with uh, her husband, Michael Staley, uh, and they, you know, still um, check in on Steffi. Uh, could she ask her? You know, uh, I didn't necessarily expect that she'd remember that well, but, she, you know, the reply came back, yeah, they did. They did go and see Inauguration of the Pleasure Dome. And I wondered, you know, it's a very, very tempting idea to, to think that it might have in some way provided a style template for their little occult soirees that, that ultimately produced, you know, the whole tunnels of set were the whole background of, of the new Isis Lodge. So all of that was kind of, you know, floating about in my head. Uh, I had a, a, a narrative of things that I was writing down because one of the things Graham later came up with was the idea that um, something of this stellar cult had survived right the way through to the time of Akhenaten and that Akhenaten's daughter Mary Tartan uh, was somehow interested in this. And uh, when uh, they got walkabout after the Akhenaten situation collapsed, and Mary Tarn, you know, there's a lot of stories now that she came to this country. Uh, for those people, you know, who are interested, Lorraine Evans' Kingdom of the Ark talks about the relation of her um, to mythology in Scotland and Ireland. But Graham felt that she'd come to, to Kent and that she actually brought the... Um, the canopic jars of Sobek Nofri Ray with her. And there was a whole weird scene that they got into in the early 80s uh, in Kent around that. And without really knowing too much about it, I seemed to tune into it uh, 10 years later. And this set off my own little psychic quest down the River Thames. And this brought me into um, configuration with... Graham's ideas of landscape tarot, which I've, I've written about a lot in my Michael line, the Kabbalah and the tarot. But the first time, the first idea of his that really struck me was that there's a church on uh, the shores of the Thames Estuary in Kent, uh, along from Herm Bay, a place called Ricolva, where there's, you know, twin towers. And he said, this is the moon cold. And if you imagine being there and you've got, you know, a, a full moon between those towers, it's a portal into particular types of magical energy and that you could use this uh, to enter into this weird zone of these Egyptians and this magic in, in Britain and along the River Thames. Thousands of years ago, it was still potentially alive. Uh, and there'd been talk of um, a statue of Anubis that these guys had left behind. And 10 years later, in the days of, of when I was associated with Andy Collins, Deb Benstead, Alex Langstone and the, the sisters, Kerry and Lisa, we, we, we all went out there uh, hoping to find a statue of Anubis. Uh, we didn't, but, and I can't remember if I told you this story in our previous chat, but the very next day, uh, an antique dealer in Leon C had a 3,000-year-old canopy jar of Dwarmatef that was slight, ever so slightly damaged on the nose, and Andy just about had enough money to buy it. Uh, and him and Deb came around my house and I ended up uh, having it for a couple of nights. You know, I had a 3,000 year old canopic jar um, in my bedroom. Uh, and I, at one point, I just got it in the living room and I'd opened up the curtains and just got the moon shining on it and burnt some incense and listened to some harp music that had been recorded in one of the pyramids. And it was just. It, it was chilled to the max and it was absolutely extraordinary because you know that you've, you've gone a long way out of consensus reality when that kind of thing's happening. Um, yeah. we, went, 
we went down to 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 uh, reculver and we took it with us and there was a, a bunch of us um including caroline wise um from the fellowship voices you know closely connected with kenneth grant and we took dramatif down on the beach and used a uh, immunovisualization i mean Deb had done a whole ceremony to, to sort of bring them back to life, whatever it was that was the magical power in Dwarmatif. And she could see him quite easily. And there were other people that could see him as well. One of the guys in the group said he looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger with a dog's head. And he was about for a long time. And, and that day, we, we let him be our guide along the Thames. You know, and it's, it's Saturday night. We've been in a pub in Reculver and we go down on the beach and there's a bunch of fishermen sitting about, you know, not all that far away from us, less than 50 metres away, and we've just sat in a big circle on the beach with this canopy jar in the middle uh, and, and all sat there with our eyes closed and done this weird visualisation. Uh, and it was absolutely awesome, of course it was. And and right now, actually, uh, as part of the, the, the creative process, uh, Yuri's obviously done an incredible painting for me about a guy as he's now doing a drawing uh, based on the idea of the moon card at Reculver. So we're going to have the Twin Towers, we're going to have Set, we're going to have Sebek, we're going to have as as the the um, kind of scarab beetle at the bottom of the card. It's broadly based on Crowley's moon card. We're going to have the Jewel of the Seven Stars and we're going to have the face uh, of, of in the moon of uh, Valerie Leon, who played um, Queen Tira in, in Blood from the Mummy's Tomb. He's working on that right now. Uh, you know, that's something that just came out of nowhere. I never even so I started writing about this stuff. It didn't occur to me that a drawing like that was possible. Now, all of this stuff, you know, people talk about Kenneth Grant not being a representation of the true um, Crowley's current, you know, that he's just taken it off and that it's a distortion and all the rest of it. But it all also fits in with um, the story that I tell in Avalonian Eon. And again, I can't remember if I went into this in our previous conversation, where they took the green stone to Egypt in 1988 and, and Crowley made a, a spectacular appearance. Uh, after um, the funeral uh, rite of Alistair Crowley, the last ritual, um, the uh, original version of it with stuff you know uh, in handwritten by lady frida harris had been found in a shoebox um in a house uh near where a bunch of people including the earth mysteries researcher paul devro and his wife they got this this base together and some guy that was doing up a house uh in the vicinity found this shoebox said you know i wonder if don't know what all this stuff is and caroline wise was there and she immediately realized it was the original version of the funeral service of alistair crowley and they were just about to go to egypt you know sign of his greatest revelation and they were going to be there on the Giza plateau on november the first which is very much kind of time we associate with the ancestors and the dead so she said well you know why don't we read out some of this uh on the Giza plateau that morning by the pyramid and they were up for it and uh, a couple of the people that had the green stone, Marion and Gaina Sunderland, were there, and and they'd already made a point of going to Hawara, which is the uh, the pyramid built by Sobek Nofri Ray's father. We don't know where Sobek Nofri Ray was buried, but her father was buried there, and her sister, who died young, was buried in the vicinity. So they had literally been around these sites associated with Sobek Nofri Ray, and then in the morning, the morning of of, of at dawn on November the 1st, 1988, they were going to do this this um, scenario at Giza. And Caroline had dreamt that she was in the presence of Anubis, and there was a whole load of weird stuff going on. And she woke up, they went there, and, and she saw um, these weird jackals come in off the desert. You know, most of these people were sitting around with their eyes closed, but she just opened her eyes and she saw these jackals. And then uh, she actually saw sitting on top of the Great Pyramid in a really weird way because obviously it's hundreds of feet away and you wouldn't expect to be able to see it properly. It's none other than Mr Crowley in his uh, 1920s little pyjama outfit um, sitting there cross-legged rocking side by side. But she's not the only one that sees it. Um, somebody else sees jackals come in and also... Um, a figure on top of the pyramid but this time yeah it's crowley again in his pajama outfit but he's doing the ritualistic signs you know sign of apophis typhon and all the rest of it paul devro himself will will is will be willing to concede that he actually saw it and he believes it was alistair crowley 
So there were some very, very, very flipping full on manifestations going on, you know, during that period of time relating to all of this. And putting it all together, uh, I also realized that um, because Dion Fortune was very important in my Thames quest and moon magic and so on, that the, the form of, of Isis, black Isis that she portrays in moon magic, uh, very, very in the same kind of vicinity, uh, a figure that's somewhere on the other side of, of the abyss, it's maybe through the dark portal that is, is so, uh, a, a very kind of dark goddess form. The book was 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 really weirdly written, postponed, started, stopped, and Dion Fortune even died before it was finished. And a medium supposedly channeled her and finished it. Doesn't come out in the end till nine fifty six, uh, and I I kind of just see it all hanging together on the inner plane with um, Grant and company seeing breaking through. Uh, the mirror, because the mirror is very important in moon magic as well, to, to the realm of Sobek Nofru Ray, the whole opening up of the tunnels is set, the whole ingress of the radiance beyond space that is the new Isis Lodge. This whole archetype all seems to all kind of configure at the same time. You know, and Grant, when you read what he has to say about Dion Fortune um, in... Um, the magical revival, uh, I think it's very clear that even if he wasn't directly influenced, you know, I'm not quite sure what happened when. It's all within a period of a few years in the, in the mid-50s that it all hangs together um, in his head. So all of this, I've got a, a section called uh, Typhonian Thames, which is going to be quite an epic uh, in the midst of the Atagati story. I, I, I knew I had to tell this bit of the story in order to fully make sense for everyone of what's going on, you know, a year and two years later. But it took on a life of its own. And it was like, um, you know, this whole stuff with Sobek Nofru Ray and the perspective of the extent of her importance in the work of Kenneth Grant really made itself known to me and there are a lot of things that were going on that were very full on but there are also some hilarious things um you know i had a we had a gathering of uh, a whole bunch of the old psychic questers got back together again in the summer some people had scarcely seen each other in decades and and caroline wise was there and, and she had actually you know there'd been an occasion where she'd been round to to see steffi grant and it'd been pouring with rain and she hadn't got a mac and steffi had said to her um well you know you're about the same height as ken if there's an old mac of his uh you know you can have that if you want so caroline turned up literally wearing kenneth grant's mac and now that, that was just one of a whole bunch of insanely surreal things that happened that just said it was all switched back on and for all of the intensity and all of the heaviness and all of the weirdness there was some trickster cosmic joker thing that is always there or thereabouts in in the stuff we do and however outrageous and outlandish it is uh we can never get too pompous about it because there are always these crazy things that happen that just force us you know to laugh out loud but that's you know that's that's it um in a nutshell, uh, where I've been for a few months now, writing all this stuff up, and as I've been writing it up, it's 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 the micro dot of what you've got in your head. You know, it's all in there, but it becomes astonishing when you try and actually lay it out in words on a page and see just how flipping much is needed to really do justice to it. Uh, and it's been exhilarating. Uh, you know, it's been almost ecstatic to just see the way that something is already there you know it's remembering you're recovering something that is already the case and writing about stuff that happened decades ago but it's still absolutely alive and it wants to make itself known in, in, you know in in shapes by my own understanding now uh, at this period of time and all of the crazy things that have happened relating to the book cover and manchester and so on and so forth are telling me that this is not just you know some nostalgic museum piece from the psychic quest in archives it's all pertinent to the great mystery of what is arising now yeah uh, it's as usual a fantastic story i mean it it, it means i'm going to ask you a potentially difficult next question which is um how do 
people listening to this and what I what I always adore about your work and talking to you is the uh, indistinguishability of the creative process and the magical process and and so on so um, how do you turn that into advice how do you uh, people listening going this sounds like a way I will ex- I would like to experience the world. How do you either get out of its way, or how do you begin with the kind of psychogeographic creative process? Like, literally, if you were to teach a class on it, now you see why it's a difficult question, Paul. <laughs> well, obviously, you've got to have already um, accepted thinking in different categories. You've already got to be um, ideally saturated with uh, a mix of magical literature, uh, you know, or mysticism uh history i think it's very important it, especially because some of these these stories are so outlandish to be be anchored you know in history i was a history nerd when i was a young person when i was at a, you know for about 10 years old so i always try and anchor it you know to facts uh, and from a, a psychological point of view you you've got to have some kind of discipline um in terms of how you live your, your everyday life or this stuff will just completely space the shit out of you and you will be all over the flipping place um you know i i have to be fit and healthy my own thing because obviously everybody's a different age a different temperament a different background speaking as someone who's 58 years old and used to do loads and loads of acid and smoke loads of dope when i was in my teens my 20s i, I can't i won't do that anymore i don't need to do that anymore but I do have to stay healthy. I do have to do exercise every day. I do have to run. I do have to go down to the gym. I do have to have a shed load of supplements. And I do have to cultivate some kind of critical intelligence. And that's where I'm very grateful for my humongous amounts of readings of Robert Anton Wilson's books, whether it's Cosmic Trigger or it's Prometheus Rising and Quantum Psychology. Because there are people just going off at the deep end with this sort of stuff. There are all kinds of people faced with the psychosphere that is now emerging or or just becoming to all intents and purposes barking mad as a result of it they're losing their critical faculties they're becoming completely paranoid the idea of chapel perilous in in cosmic trigger is very important the idea that somehow how we respond to this atrocious stuff that arises around us uh, yeah, it is real. It is out there. It has some kind of objective reality, but we are still free as to how we respond to it and whether we are enslaved by it or whether we can somehow attain to some kind of freedom, some kind of perspective within it uh, as to how it affects us uh, and so on. This is ongoing. So, you know, the stuff that I've read on, on, of Crowley and Grant's Magic, it's it's stuff that i've been doing literally for decades and you go through cycles of human experience in terms of you know birth marriage and death you know in terms of 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 like as somebody that's a father two children and both their parent both my parents are dead and so on it means that i've gone through uh various life experiences which which will shape if you are are sane and paying attention uh, the levels of importance in the way that you respond to certain things and and keeping your humor is is absolutely vital now i think what what distinguishes what happened to me earlier on in the year with with um, the manchester bombing from what chris is talking about in the states at the moment you know all all of what what chris is is producing uh, one has the sense that however much there's some weird law of nature and some strange archetypal thing arising from the depths, that there are people that are trying to manipulate this, that there are actual real physical actors in this. And, you know, the ritual theatre that, that that plays out in, in the synchronistic, synchromistic uh, field around us, that here and there there's definitely a sense that there are people fine-tuning it and trying to bring forth something. There, there, there simply wasn't any of that in my cosmic trigger, um, dangerous woman, Babylon Ishtar interface. You know, I, th- this, this was entirely down to the extent to which um, I am completely and utterly immersed in this as something that is alive rather than as just as uh, some interesting topics that I like to, to mull over 
and maybe toke of a few splits too. You know, I'm completely engaged in this stuff and have been for decades. It doesn't work in quite the same way as the psychic question used to work. The actual writing of this stuff is uh, a magical process, you know. Uh, but you've got to stay sane. Yeah, you have got to stay sane and you've got to find your way. You know, I guess being, having been a lot into Gurdjieff, the idea of having a magnetic center, the idea of self-remembering, the idea of knowing your own um, machine, your own body, your own moods, your own states, and what it takes to get the best out of them and what it is that will you know, undermine you, knowing what's good for you, knowing what's bad for you, all of that basic human being, sane psychology, uh, is definitely required more than ever uh, to navigate you know, the craziness of, of the last shout of the Kali Yuga or whatever the hell it is that's arising around us in, in you know, the land of, of, of Trump and Brexit because, you know, it is a very strange world. I mean, the thing that struck me, actually, that, that my takeaway from 2016 is not so much Brexit and Trump, it's the fact that people like Prince and George Michael can die alone. You know, that, that tells us that whatever the, the powers that be are, whatever the forces of destiny, the demiurgic intelligences or the archons or whatever the hell it is, you know, demonic geniuses like Prince and George Michael can die alone. You know, it's not, this is not a world that's completely in the sway of gentle Jesus at the moment. And we have to somehow, you know, really, really be strong in our emotional consciousness uh, in order to navigate that. Yeah, I think that's, that's you know, that's profound stuff. I agree completely. It's... Um yeah, be well read, um, be healthy, find that kind of psychological meditational balance. And uh, there's an element, I mean, you mentioned the psychic questing, right? Um, yeah. The other side is like, make sure, it's almost scuba diving, like make sure you can get back to the boat and be, and be very confident in that, but don't be afraid to... Um, it, it will take you some weird places and, and, and kind of let it do that. You've had, you had a remarkable, uh, which you've written about in some previous books, which will be in the show notes as well. But is there something to, uh, you know, find an established group or people who have done this kind of thing before? Because what comes through in your later books is the confidence of, of um, y- using these psychogeographic um synchromistic processes to uncover information and go on an adventure because it's happened to you where you've had apported objects and and you know people who see or everyone's seeing the same kind of thing so you, you yeah. don't you don't end up in a hallucinatory world so you have the confidence of knowing that this is real and is that is that one of the final pieces of advice somewhere in there do you well, think the book that I'm, I'm writing now um although it's full of all kinds of uh, you know very very powerful psychic magical narrative it's as much of a psychodrama it's like what happened to me um after all the events in avalonian eon and the psychic question and so on it's a time where i was also um i mean i do talk about uh, um my video lecture glastonbury uh, south end glastonbury cremation ground mandala that's that's a real good case study of, of when things got very, very crazy and potentially dangerous after I took, you know, Reiki 1 and I did Osho Sanyas as an energy initiation. And it was only through having read loads and loads of accounts of what had happened to people in those kind of circumstances that I was able to navigate what was some very, very crazy and dangerous stuff. And I, I'm deliberately, you know, that's a very important part of the narrative for the book I'm writing now, that yeah. it is a psychodrama and that there were bits of it that were pretty excruciating and difficult to deal with. Uh, and the more maps there are of the territory, the more people will, will maybe recognise, you know, that they're having their own version of the same process and get some kind of pointers uh, as to how, you know, how to handle it in their own way. That's, that's why I think it's very important that the more people are able to, to, to tell, you know, their own stories of, of really deep powerful processes the better for for all of us you know we need we need these maps of territory more than ever now well that is a um very useful and profound final statement to to finish up on mr weston so uh i mean i always love these chats uh, but for people who 
would obviously like to know more about yourself. Where are um, where do they go and what do they do and and, and websites right. and all that. Well, Websites are a little bit dormant at the moment, but my books are available uh, on Amazon in the USA and in the UK. Uh, and, you know, there's enough stuff floating about out there. And I've now got a number of lectures up on YouTube. Yes. And, and, and I, I particularly recommend the South End Glastonbury Cremation Ground Mandala because that is full of 18 certificate stuff. Quite a fair bit of that is going to be in the book I'm now writing. But in terms of just how flipping weird it gets, you know, when when people associated with serial killers are turning up around your flat and all the rest of it at the same time that you're undergoing, you know, magical and mystical initiatory processes and just how, how close to the edge you get. It's all in there. Um my lecture on the on the Babylon working is is the one that's been viewed the most times. That's that's a, a great uh, introduction to my Crowley book and also to the subject of the Jack Parsons, Marjorie Cameron, and so on. But there's there's a channel of of Paul Weston lectures. If you saw one of them, you'd soon discover the rest of them, uh, and they're very varied. Uh, and a lot of them. Um, do contain material that that's my own personal strange experiences as well as you know the stories of all the research material and, and the history and the great figures and so on wonderful well uh i'll have to let you go uh this was a fantastic chat i'm absolutely very much looking forward to the next book and uh, yeah and and we'll speak again soon all right cheers golden Mermaid Goddesses, Returned Egyptian Spirits, Psychogeography, and the Role of Art in Mythic Journeys. If you liked what you heard, I've linked up a few of Paul's presentations in the show notes, as well as our previous discussion in the Georgian Pilgrim from a few years back. The inspiration for checking back in with Paul is not just because he's always midway through one adventure or another, but based on a premium member inquiry regarding the Arthurian mythos. Being based in Glastonbury, this is obviously a well-travelled current for Paul, and he's also the author of perhaps my favourite Arthurian book, uh, Mysterium Artorius, which you'll also find in the show notes. So have a listen, have a watch, let me know what you think at the RuneSoup Facebook page or on runesoup.com, subscribe to the show in your favourite podcatcher or on YouTube, and of course, find me on Twitter where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time.